Good morning. Welcome to this commemoration of the 76th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Each year for, I believe, over a decade now, the Unitarian Church of Staten Island and Peace Action of Staten Island have collaborated to commemorate the horrific events of the bombings in August 1945 that took the lives of at least 200,000 people. The devastating humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons began a worldwide movement calling for their elimination. This year, on January 21st, 2021, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force at the United Nations. As the next generation learns more and more about the danger that nuclear weapons pose to the existence of life on Earth, it is hoped that we will complete the goal of abolishing nuclear weapons forever. As we discussed the theme for this year's commemoration, we talked about the theme of cover-up and we're gratified to find not only a book, but also a documentary on precisely that subject by Greg Mitchell. We're very honored to have Mr. Mitchell with us here today as our presenter. Greg Mitchell has authored nearly a dozen acclaimed books for leading publishers. His books include The Beginning or the End, How Hollywood and America Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, The Tunnels, Escapes Under the Berlin Wall, and the historic films the JFK White House tried to kill, So Wrong for So Long, How the Press, the Pundits, and the President Failed in Iraq, Hiroshima in America with Robert J. Lifton, and Atomic Cover-Up. Mitchell served as the editor of Nuclear Times Magazine from 1982 to 86, and he was the editor of Editor and Publisher, the Bible of the newspaper industry from 2002 to 2009. His articles on the atomic bombings have appeared in dozens of leading publications from the New York Times to TV Guide. He served as chief advisor to the award-winning documentary, Original Child Bomb, and he directed and produced the documentary by the same name as his book, Atomic Cover-Up, which has been receiving rave reviews at numbers of film festivals. I'm going to, uh, Sally is gonna share with you the trailer for that documentary, which hasn't yet been re released to the public. And then we'll be hearing from Greg Mitchell. After Greg's presentation, we'll have a question and answer period. Please post your questions in the chat and we'll go over them at the end of the presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> My train arrived at the Hiroshima station the day after the bombing on the way to filming at the military base. From the platform, you could see smoke still rising from the people who formerly lived in the city. The headman at the newsreel company telephoned our Osaka branch and ordered the cameraman to rush to the scene. Then there was an unexpected incident. An order quickly came back from MacArthur's headquarters in Tokyo that our film was forbidden and our footage was suddenly taken away. First time I got into Nagasaki and saw the horror and the devastation, it was pathetic. The poor children were really suffering. They had a lost look staring at me as if to say, who are you? What have you done? I remembered the shadow on the granite steps of the bank where a man was seated at the time of the blast. To recreate it visually, I had a person sitting there wearing similar clothes and then had him stand up. We decided to film all the survivors we could find in Nagasaki hospitals. We were the only people with the time and equipment to make a full record of this hidden holocaust. And the only ones shooting in color. I wanted to make a film or TV program based on our footage to warn the world about these weapons. The American public still had only seen the bomb's effects in photos of rubble, not people. 
and all in grainy black and white. I will never know if our footage and the Japanese film might have made the world safer from nuclear weapons if it had been shown to the public instead of buried for so many years. Greg, you yep. can begin. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, uh, thank you for all, uh, all of you for attending uh, this morning. Um, very happy to be be doing this, uh, especially during this uh, commemoration week, um, which uh, most of the media is not really commemorating, as you may have noticed. Um, so I'm uh, very happy to do this and happy to answer questions at the end. Um, I will. Um, as you could see, the in the trailer and even in the movie itself, which is 52 minutes long, um, we don't really get into my involvement, uh, even though I, I wrote and directed it. Um, if you just watched the whole movie now, you still would not really get an idea of, of how it came about or the background to it or who some of these, these people were. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll go through this chronologically uh, and um, that will explain all. Um, I first uh, got involved in this uh, subject in 1982, which was the, uh, the high point of the anti-nuclear movement, the freeze campaign uh, back then. And um, I was a member of the Japan Society in New York. I was living in New York City then. And uh, I attended a um, panel uh, that was, uh, this was in June of 1982, which was the same month as the mass of probably the largest demonstration in the US history, uh, the anti-nuclear demonstration in New York. Um, so there were all kinds of events throughout the city, uh, probably certainly dozens, if not hundreds. Anyway, one of them at the Japan Society, they were showing the, the first film uh, made by the Japanese based on some of this footage. And uh, they had a panel and on the panel was a man named Herbert Susson who uh, had never spoken out before. And uh, he did a little presentation revealing how uh, when he was in the US Army as a young, young man in 1945, 1946, he was sent to uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki as part of an elite US military crew and uh, to, shoot the, to shoot the aftermath of the bombing. And uh, it changed his life. He sort of became sh he was, he was shaken by the experience. He came back and for decades tried to make a movie based on this color footage, which was unique. You know, at that time there was no, no one else was shooting color footage of the aftermath. And, uh, you know, as I sort of, even in the trailer, it says Americans were, were still for decades only, could only watch um, uh, sort of the same repeated grainy black and white images, um, generally of just buildings, uh, sometimes some people, but uh, uh, kind of very soft, uh, soft kind of uh, images. And he tried to make, uh, he explained how he tried for decades to make uh, a film. And, but in fact, the film was classified, it was, it was buried, it was in the uh, military archives or national archives. He couldn't get at it. And, uh, and so this footage remained uh, unseen by anyone. Um, now, at the same time, although he didn't talk about this, the, the Japanese had shot their own footage at, uh, actually earlier than the Americans. Uh, and that was the black, little bit of the black and white footage you saw. This was an elite Japanese newsreel team that uh, was sent into these cities at the most dangerous time, literally within days of the, uh, of the bombings in both cities. And um, they too shot uh, hours of footage. Uh, again, they concentrated on the human effects. So they shot uh, uh, you know, a lot of what was happening in the, uh, the hospitals and the makeshift clinics and so forth. Um, and then the American, when the Americans arrived, uh, they told them to stop shooting. They seized the footage and told the Japanese to 
basically make a little documentary based on the footage they had, but under the direction of the Americans. So the Japanese then made a documentary with the black and white footage. Uh, and then it was seized by the Americans. Uh, it was shown to you know, medical people in the US, military, uh, and so forth. And it too was locked up in the archives for decades. Um, now I show in my film uh, and, and uh, that uh, one of the, uh, the producers of the Japanese footage uh, hid one copy of, the, uh, of uh, their little documentary in the ceiling uh, while the U.S. occupation was still there, and they kept it hidden in the in the ceiling for decades, and uh, uh, so they, that was one way they tried to hold on to it. But even then, they couldn't show it. They 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 weren't really allowed to show it by the Japanese government, and uh, so again, the world really did not see these images, the black and white images, uh, until 1970, and I can I'll get into that later. Um, uh, so just to return to my original story, the Herbert Susson um, revealing that he had helped shoot this footage and then the, this first film was made by the Japanese. And again, the only reason this color footage surfaced was because Herbert Susson had uh, attended a, in 1979, attended a, a gallery uh, near the UN, which was showing the footage, oh, excuse me, was showing photographs of the aftermath of the bombing in color. And so a lot of people were already saying, wow, color photographs, I've never seen them. And uh, Herb happened to be there. Uh, and he, so he told one of the Japanese organizers, well, I shot that, you know, in 1946. Uh, and so it turned out they had made photographs out of this, uh, some of this color footage. And it was the, the Japanese uh, that had uh, then launched because of this, what was known as the 10, 10 feet campaign. And what it was, was this massive fundraising mass movement where people donated money to buy, uh, you know, 10 feet of this original footage, which was now declassified at the National Archives. And so school children and all throughout the country, they raised the, this money to be able to purchase the color footage and return it to Japan. And they also got the black and white footage back. So. It really took from uh, 1945 to 1980 for this footage to really surface. And then it even got returned to Japan finally, and they started making uh, documentaries. In terms of my role, um, after this exposure through Herbert Susson, I then, uh, when I was at Nuclear Times, uh, uh, helped write and, and edited the first article written about this footage and about Herbert uh, Susson. And um, we published that in early 1983. Uh, as part of that, I interviewed and got exclusive uh, formally classified documents from the, the man who really directed the US film team, a man named Dan McGovern. And uh, uh, he was in, in command of the, the whole, uh, that whole operation. And so I got information from him confirming what had happened and his own efforts to uh, you know, get it, do something with the footage and uh, formally secret documents that showed how the U.S. was afraid to have this footage released and uh, ordered it top secret and classified. Uh, so I presented that article and I guess basically this film uh, that I made uh, last year and this year was 38 years in the making, you might say. Uh, I did uh, Write, uh, I did write about uh, briefly about this cover up in my book with Robert J. Lifton, uh, Hiroshima in America. And then uh, more recently, I did write an entire book about the uh, episode called Atomic Cover Up. And, uh, but I did really didn't start working on the film uh, proper till last year uh, when I was able to get at the footage at the National Archives and get um, the first 4K transfers. Um, you know, the, the footage has been there for people to use and it has been used. Uh, and you've probably seen some of the, especially black and white images. It's, so it's not that I found the footage last year and there's no one has seen any of this, uh, but most of the footage in the film people have not seen because it just hasn't been used. E even documentary filmmakers have tended to use the same 
uh, footage over and over, same few frames, and uh, and not in the best quality. So what what in my film, there's not only some footage that's never been seen, but it's also all almost all in 4K. So it's, the quality is much uh, better, uh, and, you know, and more vivid. So um, so that was my my contribution. Really was being able to do the first film about the about the cover-up uh, and, and with, with some, some new footage also. Uh, so it really is the first film that looks at the entire experience purely from the eyes of the filmmakers, both the Japanese and the Americans, and you know, cameramen you've never heard of, uh, what they saw at the time and uh, what they tried to capture and, uh, and then what happened afterwards. Uh, mainly Herbert Susson was the one who was uh, the one really trying to get this footage released. And uh, I became very friendly with his daughter, um, got more and more stuff from her and so forth. Uh, Herb passed away shortly after I met him actually, after being invited back to Japan. So he, I should, there's photos in my documentary that show uh, his return to Hiroshima and how he met some of the people he had filmed uh, back then. Uh, and then his daughter kind of carried on. She ended up moving to Hiroshima herself. Um, and, um, and so that kind of brings it up to date. And, uh, and so the, the, the cover up eventually, you know, it kind of, like you say, well, petered out. It got to be the 1970s, 1980s, and the footage became available. <laughs> but in the crucial uh, 30, 40 years of the arms race, um, it was, you know, it was, it was hidden. And this was, you know, a crucial turning point, as I'm sure you all know. Um, it was important to keep these images hidden at a time in 1946 and 1947 when the U.S. Uh, wanted to go ahead with more and bigger weapons, uh, started developing the hydrogen bomb, started the massive testing in the Pacific and then in Nevada. Um, arms race with the Soviets began, went on for decades. Um, so it was important to keep hidden the evidence of the, the actual use of the bomb, which, uh, which was the US still the only ones to use it twice. Um, and so it was important to keep these images under wraps because they were so powerful, uh, especially in the case of the color footage, very un unusual. People didn't really see anything like that. Um, and so that was the motivation, which I, you know, I've sort of tracked down from documents and from what uh, Susson and McGovern and, and the Japanese said, uh, you know, again, the, the film presents the views of the Japanese cameraman and producer. They, you know, some of them wrote uh, memoirs later or did interviews. So there were their words around the record for what, what transpired. So it's really, it's kind of a complete, even at 52 minutes, it's, it's kind of a complete look at this whole uh, episode um, and uh, and like I said it's it there's no narrator it's just all first person you know you the, the trailer kind of captures that you have the three you have the J Japanese producer you have the t the two Americans uh, and it's purely from their point of view there's no talking heads there's no uh, you know uh, Matt Damon narrating it or anything like that uh, and, um, you know, and so, it, you know, it was, I was finally, able, partly because of the pandemic, um, you know, I was stuck at home like everyone else and uh, had all the material and decided to make use of that time um, last year, uh, actually earlier uh, this year, uh, last year in the, the, the early part of this year to actually get this film uh, edited and uh, it was the original musical score uh, and uh, it's now been accepted. It's been in half a dozen film festivals with more to come. And, um, you know, it's having a very good impact for the people, people who see it. Uh, maybe, I mean, maybe partly because it's a good story, but also, again, there's a lot of images that people still have not seen. And so some people see it and they say, geez, I've never seen this before. I can't believe this. I'm, uh, which in a way, reveals the effectiveness of the cover-up that that even at this late date a lot of images and a lot of even sentiments of what people were expressing and 
what they felt or what happened with the government or why uh, people wanted to cover it up still seems new, new to people. So, um, so that's kind of the chronology. Um, I can go into you know details on any any one of those areas, um, but you know my motivation. Uh, I mean, really going back for for decades. You know, people people say even now, or, or especially now, well, that's. Well, it's terrible what happened or, you know, uh, I get it, historic event, uh, it's, you know, uh, it's, it's too bad it had to happen and everything. But what, what, what does talking about it do going to, why is it important to talk about it today? Why, you know, why does it matter? Uh, why waste so much time and energy on something that happened? You can't undo it. You can't bring back the dead. You can't change the decision. Uh, you know, why bother? And so, of course, for me, I mean, there's two answers. Of course, there's the moral issue, um, uh, and the fact that the U.S. And, and the U.S. public, and especially the media and officials, have not really come to grips with this uh, kind of moral crime. Um, so that alone would be worth continuing to study this. But the second thing is that the, the more practical reason is that, again, as you, you probably know, but uh, most other people may not, is that the U.S. still has a first use or first strike policy, which was initiated with Hiroshima. Uh, it's still official U.S. policy to use nuclear weapons first in any conflict as we choose. The, government, the president has the uh, ability to do that. Um, it could be after we are attacked with a conventional weapons, not nuclear weapons. It could be if we're just threatened. Um, you know, we want to hit Iran first before Iran does something or North Korea before North Korea does anything. Uh, so this first use policy is, is uh, very much in effect. Uh, you know, Obama talked about maybe moving away from it. Biden has talked about maybe moving away from it. Uh, of course, people were freaking out when Trump was in the White House, I think, including some of the Joint Chiefs. But you know, the fact he's not there, again, people may be going to sleep again on this issue. So, um, but in any case, it's still in effect. And uh, the, you know, the lesson of Hiroshima is, you know, it, maybe you can use nuclear weapons and get away with it. Um, certainly the media and uh, officials and US, even U.S. presidents every year continue to, in, in the main, endorse the use of the bomb, even though they will say, oh, it was terrible and we should never use them again and uh, so forth. They will come around and say, well, you know, it, it ended the war. We had to end the war. It's the only thing that ended the war and so forth. So as if that's an exception, you know, as if a, a president today could not say the same thing about uh, some use, um, some need to use. And people would say, well, yeah, we used them twice already. And it seems like most people accept that. So so to me, it's a tremendous, uh, I wouldn't say motivation for using nuclear weapons, but it's certainly a rationale where, you know, any president could decide that some, some crisis uh, calls for the use of nuclear weapons. And we've gotten, we've defended it for 76 years. And um, so I, I never buy the art when people say we must never, most of the people who say we must never use them again would be, you know, would support <laughs> using them again you know, under the right circumstances. So uh, the never again does not really uh, hold much uh, weight with me. Um, so that's, it's motivated me all these decades to continue active on this issue and write all these books and articles and now go to film. Uh, you know, it's enough to, you know, uh, keep me going on this. And, uh, you know, there's some evidence, but not overwhelming evidence that younger people have a different view or may have a different view. I think in the main, they're really not aware of much of this issue and haven't studied it and considered it. So um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of the, the film in a nutshell and the background and my own motivation. So um, certainly be happy to take any questions. I guess you can put them in chat or however you want to do it. Um, I don't have chat open now, so I can't go right to them. But um, now if, if Sally would sort of move her head a little bit, her background, uh, which uh, maybe you can see, is uh, Daniel McGovern, the head of the US film unit in Nagasaki. He's got a camera there. 
and he is uh, in the ruins of Nagasaki uh, in front of the Urakami Cathedral. And of course, one of the, I, I guess I will be shift, shifting my focus to Nagasaki starting today. Um, you know, there are people who will say, I think Hiroshima was necessary, but Nagasaki you know, was a war crime. Uh, now I certainly agree with the war crime part, but, um, <laughs> but here is uh, McGovern in front of the, Ur now, the Urakami Cathedral was the largest uh, Catholic cathedral in the Far East. It was in the middle of a Catholic uh, neighborhood on the edge of Nagasaki. Um, and it's estimated that 10,000 Catholics who lived in that neighborhood were killed by the bomb because the bomb did explode slightly off target. You know, the, the Hiroshima bomb was uh, dropped intentionally at the very center of the city to kill the maximum number of people. And it succeeded. It was very much on target. And so it killed, you know, 130,000 people or whatever the, the total is. The Nagasaki bomb, you know, people will say, well, it only killed 70 or 90,000 or something. And, uh, but the intention was the same. The target was the very center of the city. Nagasaki is, was basically built on two valleys with a mountain ridge in between. You can actually see that on the right. Uh, and it was, so it was supposed to explode over the harbor and then go up both valleys and, and kill everybody in the two valleys. It, but in fact, it exploded uh, slightly up this one uh, valley uh, nearly over the cathedral. And, uh, and so everyone was wiped out in that community, but you know, only uh, 70 to 90,000 were killed, um, mainly in that valley. So, but anyway, here's McCovern in front of that uh, cathedral. So Sally, you can take your place again. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'm ready for any, uh, any questions now. We have one question from Sally, which is, how do we see the film? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, like it's been, um, like I said, it's been shown in half a dozen festivals. Each of the festivals uh, so far has been virtual, uh, not in person. And um, they have had varied um, rules for viewing it. Uh, one festival charged $10 a ticket, uh, one charged $3, uh, a couple it's been totally free. You know, uh, sometimes it's shown one night, sometimes three nights, sometimes a whole week. Um, so it's been out there for the viewing. Now I, uh, and, uh, I'm in, uh, there. it's in two other festivals coming up at the end of September. And um, I expect several more uh, right after that. But uh, if you want to make note the Breckenridge or Breck Film Festival in Colorado, which is a major festival near the end of September, is going to be virtual and in person right now. I don't know if the in-person will happen, but it, there will be opportunities to view the film uh, virtually. And about the same week, the, uh, there's a festival uh, that's gone on for 20 or 30 years out of Orlando uh, called, uh, I, I think it's Global Peace or Global Peace and Security or something. And you, sh you should be able to find that too. Uh, at the end of September, they too are gonna try to do virtual and in person, I'd be very, skeptical of the in-person part, given it's Florida. Um, but they, uh, and maybe they will have it up for, for free. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, that's two festivals. There'll be more after that, but it has not been, um, I mean, this may be revealing of how the U.S. versus Europe views uh, the atomic bombings, but they've had three that the film has been purchased by three major cable networks in Europe, in uh, uh, Spain, for example, and uh, Germany and the Baltics and the Netherlands and so forth, um, to be shown, to be streamed there on major uh, cable networks, but none in the US so far. So it's, it's quite possible that it will be picked up for uh, streaming or a PBS station in the US, but right now it is not available just for anyone to go, you know, go watch it when they, when they want to. So you have another question, which is um, from Mohan, being at the site of the atomic bomb affected area, I'm surprised that McGovern didn't wear a mask. Looks <laughs> like no safety protocols followed by the observers, any thoughts? 
Yeah, well, yeah. The, um, by the time uh, McGovern and Sussan got there, um, the radiation effects were much lower. Uh, they were given badges sometimes. It was very, they, in fact, there's a quote in the film from the Govern about these kind of useless badges. They were given badges sometimes and not other times. It didn't seem to line up with where they were. Uh, um, so uh, I, I'm not sure they wore masks, but the, the, the real ones who were in peril even more were the Japanese who went in literally within hours or days afterwards. So they were the real brave, uh, brave people. They certainly went in without no uh, badges or no uh, uh, masks or anything like that. And they were, were very much in the ruins. But it should be mentioned that, um, you know, the, the American occupation of the two cities began in early, uh, early to late September of 1945. And you had tens of thousands of US troops, I think mainly Marines and Navy who occupied Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they, you know, they slept in the ruins and they, you know, went in and out and were doing studies and were just doing whatever occupation forces do uh, uh, for months. And that really has not been studied. There's never been a book written about the U.S. occupation of the two atomic cities. Uh, but the uh, veterans, there are various veterans groups over the years have uh, chronicled cancer effects, um, other illnesses from people who occupied the cities to, to attempt to get the federal, um, you know, to pay for things and recognize this. And they've gotten a very limited response. Uh, in fact, Herb Susson, the guy who kicked us all off, he uh, got lymphoma and, and ultimately died, you know, uh, at the age of uh, I don't know, 59 or something. And he always, uh, I guess one doctor told him that his effects were consistent with radiation exposure, but you know, as is usual in these cases, never proven, very hard to prove. Um, so there's still an untold story there in a way of the uh, tens of thousands of American troops who, you know, who went in there. Uh, and, uh, and of course the Japanese, as we know, uh, survivors passed away for many years from the after effects, um, but mainly from the after effects of being exposed nearby during the bombing, uh, not so much from what they picked up in the, you know, the weeks and months after that. Alfred says, I've heard that the CIA had a psychological operation in Japan in the early 1950s to get the Japanese to accept the so-called peaceful atom in the form of nuclear power. Can you confirm this? And can you comment on how nuclear power today is a cover story for nuclear weapons? Uh, I don't know about the CIA thing. It doesn't mean it didn't happen, but I'm not really an expert on that, uh, that particular issue. Certainly the Japanese were, the American occupation last, lasted for five years and uh, they were certainly urged to get over their feelings about the bombing. And uh, even though the Japanese, the new Japanese constitution uh, forbid them um, it, building nuclear weapons or housing nuclear weapons. The US after, after a while uh, secretly uh, started uh, storing some nuclear weapons at, at their bases. They would have uh, ships that would come into Japanese bases with loaded with nuclear weapons. And there'd always be a, a controversy in Japan, protests in the street, you know, nuclear weapons coming back to Japan and the US would deny it, but it was totally proven that we uh, you know, we, we were doing that. Um, so, but, you know, Japan has had controversies for decades now, uh, Japanese militarists and the, sort of the pro-military um, anti-pacifist um, um, uh, people in Japan have said we should get away from this ban. Um, now, they have not banned nuclear power, as you know. And of course, we had the Fukushima accident uh, not so long ago. Um, so Japan has accepted nuclear power with, with reluctance uh, years ago, and um, nowadays um, not so much. So, um, but you know, it, it you know nuclear. And that's of course a whole related, but a whole another subject. Nuclear power, of course, remains a, 
a threat uh, in the U.S. Uh, accidents could happen around the world, and of course, what to do with nuclear waste, uh, which is an eternal problem. So, we've had a whole history. My book with uh, Robert J. Lifton, Hiroshima in America, kind of chronicles the uh, the fifty, the first fifty years of um, U.S. involvement with nuclear weapons, uh, all these various strains of the uh, how nuclear. Um, nuclearization of U.S. Um, policy and uh, even energy policy, uh, the threats and the, the things people have, ra have raised over the years and the studies and uh, people who were affected by all the bomb tests, you know, in, the, in the Nevada. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a sad, uh, sad story now going for 76 years. I'm going to open up the chat myself just to see if I see something, but go on. You can have, pull another question out of that. Well, Lynn was asking, are we screening it today, the film by Zoom? No, we are not. And then there was a question about, is there a website where we can get information about future screenings? Yes. Uh, yes. Look, what I should do I should is, uh, if you have the chat open, I mean, I will type, what I will do is uh, I'll type in my email, my Gmail address, uh, and I, I could actually say it to you. It's uh, gregmitch47 at gmail.com. Um, you can write, if you want to write me today, then I will send you, uh, I have a, I have both a web page for the film and a medium, at, at medium, I have an updated uh page with uh, the latest information and where it's screening and, and various uh, responses from people, reviews. Uh, I can send you that link. It's too long a link to put here, but, um, but that's, um, but I, again, I'll remind you there that we know for sure of this Breck film out of uh, Colorado, Breckenridge, Colorado, and this global, I think it's global peace and security, but if you put in global film festival, Orlando, Florida, you will find it. And Sally writes, there's a new book called Fallout by Leslie Bloom about how John Hershey made his trip to Japan in 1946 and created his book, Hiroshima. Did you uncover anything about his trip in your research? Well, there's a major uh, section about uh, the Hersey that, is, uh, that covers most of what's in her book. Uh, in um, in my my book from last year, the beginning or the end, and I I, I guess I, I should say a little bit about that because it is sort of a related. Uh, the subject of the book is uh, a little more entertaining, perhaps, than uh, this uh, film. Uh, is the uh, uh, effort by MGM in 1946 to make the first movie about the atomic bomb uh, a big. Hollywood blockbuster, and um, it was inspired by the scientist uh, movement, the sort of anti-nuclear scientist movement. And I, I won't go into it, but actually the, the person who kind of got it going was, was the actress Donna Reed. I'm sure you remember. But um, so just in a nutshell, it, was, it, it began as this <clears throat> MGM uh, blockbuster that was going to in, in, embrace the views of the scientists who were opposed, uh, who were raising questions about the use of against Hiroshima and building more weapons. And then over the course of a year, it was entirely gutted and uh, the viewpoint changed 100% after the intervention by President Truman. Uh, General Leslie Groves, who directed the Manhattan Project and the others in the Pentagon. And so this film, which had started up, started up potentially to have a, a very positive effect, uh, became this kind of laughable um, pro-nuclear propaganda film that was released in early 1947, which was called The Beginning or the End. Um, so you can find the book or you can find a lot of things I've written about it. If, again, if you just search on Google, I wrote last year, the, I, I wrote articles or there were excerpts in about 15 different magazines. Um, and in fact, there, there's, I did three excerpts uh, on the John Hersey. So again, if you search, you will find three separate pieces that were published from the book about John Hersey's decision to 
go to Hiroshima, what happened when his uh, article and book were originally published, and then how a few months later, again, there was a suppression, a backlash, and how the US tried to counter the book and get it out of the American conscience, which was, which it was partly successful. And um, so anyway, it's a good question. We have a question from Zora. Are you familiar with the, atom, the atomic bomb suppressed by Monica Bra? Yes, that's another book I have had for decades. And I had a little correspondence with her uh, a couple of years ago um, about the, the subject, about the footage and what else, if she knew more about it or if she had more information, uh, which, which she didn't. She had something on, she had interviewed one of the Japanese filmmakers on tape. And she tried to find the tape, or she did find the tape, and it was just unlistenable. So as recently as uh, probably a year and a half ago, I had correspondence with her. And Eureka says, thank you for bringing up the color footage into light. I saw the black and white footage of the disaster released from the US when I was about sixth grade, broadcast on TV in Japan. It scared me a lot but the color one would bring more impact globally. I look forward to seeing the film from New York City. Yeah, well, uh, thank you. Uh, it was good. I, I, I don't know how, how old you were or when you were, uh, or what year that was when you were in sixth grade, but as I mentioned briefly, the um, black and white footage, uh, well, I mean, it's a couple interesting stories about it. I mean, uh, the, as I mentioned, the, uh, Japan crew hid um, some of the footage in a ceiling for, for several years. Um, and then when the occupation ended, the Japanese government and the Japanese media didn't really want it aired because they, they wanted to turn the page uh, on Hiroshima and, and they didn't really want to be seen so much as victims. You know, I mean, they wanted to put World War II behind them. Um, you know, again, as some of you know, Japan ha has had a problem owning up to what happened in World War II. Um, and so uh, even the Japanese government was not really interested in having these images shown. Um, but the filmmakers did smuggle some of it out. And actually the first, very first place any of it appeared was in the, the classic uh, uh, movie, Hiroshima Mon Amour. Well, if you wanna go back and watch that movie, you will see uh, snippets of the black and white footage that was used in that. Um, but the really the full use of the footage did not happen. Uh, uh, sort of started around 1968, 69, when uh, Eric Barnow, who I interviewed, who was uh, one of the leading, if not the leading expert on documentary films in America. Um, he taught up at Columbia, quite a legend, many books. Um, he found out about this footage uh, in the, the black and white footage and that it actually had been declassified. And so he contacted the Japanese producer named Iwasaki, who was in my film, and um, made use, he was the first person to make use of this footage. And basically he put together a 16 minute documentary uh, called Hiroshima Nagasaki 1945 that was shown on uh, what was then pre-PBS, I don't know if it was called National Public TV or I can't remember now, Educational TV. It might have still been called NET, National Educational Television. It was showed at stations around the country. Some stations did refuse to show it. Um, and it finally aired, it was 1969 or 1970, I think 1970. Uh, it did air and it got a lot of, it was, caused a lot of controversy. A lot of people thought it shouldn't have been aired. The New York Times had kind of a snarky review of it. Um, but this 16 minute version out of the um, couple hundred minutes that the Japanese had produced, um, you know, was an important document and that, and that then was shown in Japan. And then the Japanese started again, making their own films. So, uh, um, but that's what that, that's what that classic, uh, and that film, that 16 minute film then became uh, widely sold, you know, in the 1980s and the anti-nuclear movement was uh, widely uh, sold on videotape by uh, peace groups. 
Sally asks, did the US occupying soldiers take private photos that have since been uncovered? Yes, I get sent them all the time. Uh, you know, there are so many uh, soldiers stationed there that, um, you know, their children or grandchildren inherited or, or have, fo have photos, you know, have photos that were taken. Now, almost all the photos were just of, you know, it's of rubble or someone's there documenting, you know, I was here, not, not exactly tourists, but, you know, here's a wrecked building and here's a, you know, wrecked landscape and so forth. Now, again, of course, they didn't get in there till more than a month later, or some people didn't get in there for six months. Um, they, by and large, they did not go into the hospitals. Uh, I, I'm not sure I've ever seen private photos of, you know, like of hospital scenes. Um, I don't think I have, although a couple doctors have written books about serving there in the hospitals. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly the soldiers documented, um, you know, documented being there. Um, and uh, um, so that's not, you, 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 you may, may see some of those. It's, it's not that no one could take photos, but the, it was the film footage that was so unique. You asked, do you think there was any justification for dropping both of those bonds? Uh, you know, I, when I came to this subject in, um, you know, in the 1980s, um, you know, I, I was not an expert on this. And I, I suppose I had the view that many, you know, many have words just say, well, I don't, I've always, always terrible moral thing, but I don't, maybe it helped end the war. Maybe it didn't. I, I don't know. I was hard. I didn't, wasn't enough of an expert to, and, and at that point, uh, this new wave of evidence that emerged did not emerge until the 1980s. Um, so the, the the sources for information were uh, old and, and you know, there'd been a debate about it and it was just really the same arguments that were being made. So it was hard to, uh, Gar Alperovitz wrote an important book that helped start to change that. Um, and, and, but the real turning point was, what for me was I got a journalism grant to go to Hiroshima and Nagasaki for a month in 1984, which was very unusual at the time. And uh, maybe even today, most uh, American journalists uh, only go for a couple of days. They may only go at the commemoration week. Uh, they go in and out, they interview a few survivors, um, whatever, you get the same stories, but it's based on very limited experience. Well, here is a chance to go for, you know, for a full month and go to both cities. And, um, and so I interviewed not just, you know, countless survivors, but uh, various uh, experts, radiation experts, uh, historians, um, doctors who had treated patients, um, uh, U.S. military went on a couple of U.S. military bases uh, near Hiroshima, right? so it was a full picture. It was not slanted, and 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 it really was not centered on. Oh, this is going to be a month of studying the use. You know whether the using the bomb was a good idea. Um, it was be, even the survivors would just say, "I can only tell my story." You know, this is what happened to me. Uh, make you know, sort of make of it what you will. It was not a propaganda tour, um, but you know, obviously, I took a lot out of that. Uh, and then, in, it was only in the years after that that I, you know, studied more of the history. I went to the Truman Library twice. Uh, much more evidence came out of what was known at the time, and um, you know, it, and so it became clear to me that. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, well, clearly, and, I, and again, I would refer you to either my book, uh, The Beginning or the End from last year, or my book with Lifton, Hiroshima and America, which have large sections on the decision and the aftermath and so forth. But, you know, basically came to believe that Nagasaki was completely unnecessary and a, and a war, true war crime, and that Hiroshima was became more and more similar when you read about what the U.S. knew at the time, what we knew about Russia's entry into the war, uh, what Truman thought was going to happen when Russia entered the war, that basically, uh, as, he, as he wrote in his diary, Finney Japs, when that occurs. Uh, 
so it became clear that uh, if the U.S. had waited um, a short while, that uh, a surrender could have been uh, could have been um, enacted in the same time frame uh, without the use of either weapon. So that's sort of where I finally landed, and I, I look at all the new evidence, um, and there's sort of pro and con pro and con evidence that comes out, and you have to look at it seriously. But it, you know, it's basically you know, my belief is that, you know, put all the evidence out there and then let people decide. But just people, most people are so locked into their, their beliefs or what they've been told. So you'll hear to this day, at least half the narrative on this as well. It's the only thing that ended the war. And, you know, my grandfather told me he would have died in an invasion. And if there'd been an invasion, half a million would have died. And there's just no question that that would have happened without any recognition that things could have gone differently. So um, that's really what you're up against when you're, you know, it's 75 years of, uh, um, I would maybe wouldn't call them myths, but let's say incomplete information on what, what the true uh, options were then. <clears throat> Elaine asks, can you please provide titles and names of books written by doctors who worked in hospitals? Yeah, I, I really can't. Uh, it's a little too much to retain in my, uh, my hard drive here. <clears throat> but I think you could find them. <clears throat> I think one doctor was named Lebo, L E B O W, uh, maybe. <clears throat> and I know there's at least one other, uh, one other book. There might be more than two books. Um, and there, you know, there were famous books that are probably still available by the Japanese physicians. Uh, there is a, uh, a Nagasaki man named Akazuki, Dr. Akazuki, who I interviewed, A-K-I-Z-U-K-I, -I, wrote a famous book. Uh, I can't remember. I think Nagasaki's in the title. And there was a, a bestseller, actually, in the late 1940s called Hiroshima Diary, uh, which I'm sure is still available. A doctor's name, I believe, was Hidaya, H-I-D-A-Y-A. -A. Um, uh, and, and there was a doctor named Nagano, Nakano, Nagano, I think, wrote a book called, uh, I think, Bells of Nagasaki or something like that. Anyway, there are countless books out there which you can, can search and find. I just, I just don't have it all, all stored here. <clears throat> and Lynn Siegel has her hand raised. Lynn, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Yeah, I don't understand because Guy Apparetti clearly we 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 surrendered. I mean, the Japanese surrendered. Clearly, it's in the Potsdam Conference. It's redacted in Chapter 14 or something. The emperor surrendered unconditionally his position as emperor or whatever they wanted, it was all done. Why don't you have that in your records? This was completely illegal. There's no question about it, no question. I don't understand. You're, you're someone who's revealing a cover-up. This is the major cover-up. We did it simply to save ourselves with Russia. That's why we did it. I don't understand. Why people like you don't get this? Uh, I think I get this. I'm not sure what you're what you're what you're claiming here. Uh, in fact, I just mentioned uh, two minutes ago the uh, people's la lack of recognition that uh, Russia was uh, about to enter the war, and how that's not not has not been a prominent part of the uh, of the evidence, and that people are not uh, Americans do not know about that. Uh, so I've already already mentioned that, and uh, in the Potsdam conference, the the, the, Potsdam declaration, the Potsdam Declaration demanded the unconditional surrender of Japan. Okay. And they did. And the well, they would we demanded the unconditional surrender of Japan, and people at the time, including top uh, you know top Truman aides, said uh, at the time said, well, you know, if we if we tell them expressly that the emperor can remain at least as a figurehead, this might produce surrender in short order uh, as a condition. We did not do that. And then- Oh, we did, according to Guy Apparetti. After we dropped the two bombs, we then accept, obviously, because we accepted it, because the emperor remains today as a figurehead. 
So after dropping the two bombs, we then made that condition, but we didn't really, and everyone knew it, though that we knew the emperor remained, that was not covered up. It's just, we did not emphasize it after the surrender. We didn't say, well, we had to make one condition or, um, you know, we let the emperor stay. And, you know, we could have done that before and it may have produced, I mean, that's the, the main argument that I've made over and over is that the, the combination of the letting the emperor stay and uh, waiting for Russia's entry into the war. And, and again, there were the top Truman aides who said this at the time, not afterwards, would have produced surrender in the same time frame, whether it would have been you know, a week later, or two days later, or three weeks later. Um, and I, you know, I believe that's what evidence, uh, that, that's what the evidence uh, suggests. Others disagree, of course. Before the bombs were dropped, before. Okay, I'm not sure you're listening, but I've, I've said this three times already. So I'm not sure how much, what more I can say. <clears throat> I don't know what more I can say. Okay. Before the drums were, were dropped, everything was done and we bombed them anyway. Okay. I don't know any other way to see it. It's completely, it's unbelievable that this could just be, denied by everyone, you know, like, I don't know. There's no hope if that's the case. I'm sorry that I have to exit because I have a commitment this afternoon. So Sally is gonna take over moderation of any further questions. I think we did go through the questions in the chat. And I just wanna thank you so much, Greg, for being here today in your presentation and all the, the wealth of information you've provided. Well, again, very happy to do this. And again, if people want to get in touch with me, um, you know, I'll give you my email again. It's gregmitch47. And, and Sally posted your email in the chat. Email.com. So, and uh, again, uh, there's, there's sites I can send you to if you write, if you write to me. Uh, we're, we're very, very um, uh, grateful for you being here. Um, if there are any other questions, please put them in now. I don't know if you can stay another couple of minutes, Greg. Yeah, I think, uh, five minutes is good. Okay. Just in case I see one new message. Let's see. I know people are very, very passionate about this issue, especially our Peace Action <laughs> members and, uh, and other guests here. You know, we're very passionate. Uh, and uh, one question just before you... Um, you leave with the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. Have you, um, has that affected anything you've seen on your side from your research on how um, the world is looking at nuclear weapons? Well, there's always been this disparity between how the world looks at it and how the United States looks at it. So I think that's the, I mean, that's, that's the problem. And, uh, and of course, the US is so much of the, the problem uh, with the uh, nuclear arsenals, uh, nuclear threat. I, I mentioned the first use policy earlier, but just the existence of, we, we still have thousands of nuclear weapons at the ready. Uh, of course, massive nuclear waste problems and so forth. So, um, you know, the world has kind of spoken out against nuclear weapons by and large, you know, almost from the beginning. Uh, but it's very hard to get things passed with any force at all without the U.S. And of course, the U.S. and Russia uh, and the Soviet Union when they were around. Uh, very hard to get the, these things passed. You know, I, I mean, you still have the France and uh, the U.K. You've got Pakistan with nuclear weapons now, North Korea, Israel. You know, it, it's quite a nuclear club now. So it's without their cooperation, it's hard to, you know, you can pass resolutions all you want, but you, you really need to bring pressure. And I, I, as, I, as I said, um, what's a little depressing is the America's lack, still lack of coming to grips on this, with this uh, subject. Uh, last year, uh, I, I know most of you were around for the 50th anniversary where there was massive coverage cover stories and, you know, Time and Newsweek, network TV specials, um, uh, 
all sorts of films and documentaries and so forth on the fifth for the 50th anniversary uh, to, 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 to kind of force a uh, reconsider reconsideration. And that didn't even happen with the 75th. There was almost nothing, um, partly due to COVID, partly due to the American election, but still so little. In fact, what the, the, the most uh, popular or prominent media uh, public opinion uh, things last summer was Chris Wallace's best-selling book and his Fox uh, TV special, um, both you know defending the use of the bomb, and there were other other things defending it. So the, if anything, to me, it was a step back from the 50th anniversary. So um, you know, I mean, I'm hopeful things are going to change. Uh, that the younger generation is going to you know help spark a different view, but uh, I have to say it's, uh, it, I, I'm, I'm looking for signs of real hope in the media coverage or US officials speaking out, but uh, uh, there's not a whole lot. You know, Obama did go to Hiroshima. I mean, there, there was, uh, again, I thought maybe something in there. Obama was the first president to go to Hiroshima while in office. Um, Earlier, he had sent the first time the U.S. ambassadors to Hiroshima and Nagasaki for the commemorations. Uh, very positive step, but you know, I guess largely symbolic. So, um, no, we'll see what happens now as uh, uh, maybe younger people take take more control. Yeah. Well, I I know that if anybody wants to get involved, please uh, contact uh, Pete. Peace, uh, Peace Action of Staten Island. I put the uh, pazzy.contact at gmail.com or also Peace Action New York State info at panys.org. Uh, Peace Action does work on US foreign policy and uh, with many other organizations works to change um, the policy in US Congress. There's several bills that um, you can um, work on, uh, so please get in touch with us. And I see Alfred's hand up, and maybe you can have the next to the last word, <laughs> Alfred, before we close up. Thank you, Sally, and I just wanted to thank Greg so very much for this important work. I think what you just said about people not really appreciating the dangers of nuclear weapons is, is uh, so, so important to highlight. In fact, we're trying to create usable nuclear weapons. Uh, All right which is really uh, the wrong way. And uh, my earlier question was really, uh, it's my opinion that nuclear power is used as part of the effort to cover up the real impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, there's uh, been a number of reports in the past few years uh, highlighting how civilian nuclear power is a quote, fundamental enabler of national security. Those are words of uh, ex-Secretary of Energy Ernie Moniz right. talking about how the, you know, it's you, parents aren't going to want to tell their church members that their kids are making new atom bombs, but it sounds pretty good if they're working on nuclear power to solve climate change, aside from the fact that nuclear power cannot solve climate change. Um, but so I think that, um, you know, you're highlighting the fact that we really need to make this much uh, better understood and we need to understand the uh, real dangers we're in. Yeah, well, there, there has been, a, I don't know if it's a trend, but certainly in the past year or two, um, been more people speaking out in favor of nuclear power. You know, people who consider themselves green uh, environmentalists who are saying we, we, we have to make a choice here and the nuclear power can, can help uh, solve climate change. So it's, uh, again, unfortunately, an argument that is uh, gaining, uh, you know, a certain amount of popularity. And it's going to, it's going to stay with us because, you know, the more we emphasize climate change, the more alternatives are going to be suggested. So nuclear is not going to go away. So we, we have to learn how to make the counter arguments to that. Okay, well, thank you very much, Greg. This was very informative. We will send around uh, the recording to everybody who registered and, and share it. And I know that some people asked about the, um, maybe we'll, we'll edit the chat and some of the links that you put in there 
or other people put in, we'll share with the people who registered. Okay. And um, really, thank you so much. I think, I hope you get the book. It's a, if you can't, I don't know if you can see this. I want to get rid of my uh, back. Uh, you know, again, the, yeah, the, the book Atomic Cover-Up does, it, it's, there, there is some stuff in the movie that's not in the book, but um, the book does cover it pretty well. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that's readily available. If you're, if you're interested but you know thank you for having me i appreciate it great questions great uh, great discussion i'm very very happy to do it well, we really appreciate your time and everybody who came thanks so much thank and you. thank for your passion everybody's passion keep working at it um uh, it, it's not going to change if we don't uh keep at it um, okay we're, we're going to keep pushing abolish nuclear weapons no more hiroshima's no more nagasaki's all right. Thank you. Well, thanks again. Thank you very much.